Oral Hershiser was drafted by the Los Angeles Dodgers to make his major league appearance in 1983. However, his start into the major league baseball world did not go as anticipated. Early in 1984, Earl Hershiser was called in for a meeting with then Dodgers manager Tommy Lasorda. In his book, Out of the Blue, Earl Hershiser says that that confrontational meeting was what he affectionately referred to as the Sermon on the Mound. And he said, Tommy Lasorda began to say to him, you have greater potential than you're demonstrating. You owe it to this team to reach your potential. And then Lasorda went one step further. He said, and by the way, I've nicknamed you Bulldog. Well, Oral Hershiser didn't like that name to start with, but second of all, it didn't really fit him. It didn't fit his physique, nor did it match his personality. But Lasorda would later on say about that nickname, he said, I was trying to give him a name to draw out of him everything that I believed that he was to be and how he was to pitch. I wanted him to be ferocious. I wanted him to be intense. I wanted him to be competitive. And as one author would say about this particular nickname in his life, he says that the nickname became a perpetual reminder of what Hershiser ought to be, and before long, it shaped his whole attitude. Friends, the Apostle Peter writes this letter in the New Testament, the first letter that he wrote, and he starts out by reminding the disciples of Jesus Christ who they are to be. He tells them, this is your name, this is who you are. Because everything that you are to live out comes back to this foundation of who you were called to be and who God says that you are. The New Testament letter of First Peter was written by the Apostle Peter to help believers know who they are in Jesus so that they could know how they are to live in this world for Jesus Christ. The letter of First Peter was written by the Apostle he was one of the 12. Even more than that, Peter was one of an inner circle of Jesus' three closest companions. It was Peter, James, and John. And Peter was imperfect. He was called by Jesus knowing that he was going to be imperfect, not the least of which was his imperfections that on the very night before Jesus was to be crucified, Peter denied knowing Jesus or even being with him three times. And yet Jesus came to him. He extended grace and mercy to him. He restored Peter in relationship to himself, but also in ministry for the kingdom. And Jesus gave him a commission. Peter, if you love me, you're going to obey me and you're going to care for my sheep. And the book of Acts is a testimony of Peter sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and shepherding the flock of God. In the New Testament, we find that Peter, even after his failure, is restored by God's grace and mercy to be a follower of Jesus who is sharing the gospel and shepherding the flock. Jesus said, if you love me, feed my lambs. And we see in the book of Acts how Peter was sharing the good news and how he was leading the church he was to be a rock of leadership. He was to be a testimony of witness for Jesus, and he was to care for God's church, and he did. And part of that care that Jesus had called him to was pinning this letter to believers. He's writing this letter to a group of believers who are in the provinces of what is in modern-day Turkey. The space of these provinces takes up about 129,000 square miles. For reference, the state of New Mexico is about 121,000 square miles. That's where these believers are dispersed. And Peter writes to them this letter to say, I want you to remember who you are, and I want you to know how you are to live. And we come to the first two verses of this letter. It's the only two verses we'll look at today. 
But these verses lay the foundation for everything that Peter's going to go on to say after this moment. Because he's going to say, this is who you are. And this should shape how you live your life in this world. And so we read these together. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, we read, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. You are elect exiles according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. As Peter is writing these words to those first century Christians, they are still God's living and active words to you and me today. And the first thing that Peter says to us is that we are a people chosen by God according to his purpose. We are a people of God chosen by God according to his purpose. Notice that he identifies himself first as Peter. He didn't really need to say he's an apostle but because by this point, most everybody knows who Peter is. He includes that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ so that they will know the authority with which he is writing these words. He is Peter, the apostle, who was with Jesus from his baptism all the way through his earthly ministry. He saw him crucified, buried, and risen again. And now he's writing to these believers. And he says, to those of you who are elect exiles, the word of elect, elect the word chosen. This word brings us to this teaching of the Scripture, which is often referred to as the doctrine of election. Chadwick Thornhill says that the doctrine of election teaches us that about God's choice of a person or people group for a specific purpose, mission, or salvation. God chooses people for a unique and special relationship with himself. And Peter comes in the very opening of this letter to say something about the doctrine of election. You are elect exiles. You are chosen ones. God has chosen you. Now, this doctrine of election has been something that the church has argued about for a long time. And here's the thing. Remember this. Peter's not trying to write a systematic theology book. He's not trying to tell us everything that we would want to know about the doctrine of election in these opening verses. In fact, all he ever says about election in this moment is that you are elect exiles according to the foreknowledge of God. But the Bible does speak about this doctrine, so we dare not deny it. But it's been a source of contention, and it remains a source of contention among believers. For in this doctrine of election, there are those that often refer to themselves as the Reformed theologians, and they set themselves apart from the non-Reformed theologians. You might sometimes hear it talked about it in this way. There are Calvinists, and there are Arminians. Calvinists emphasize that God is sovereign over all of salvation and that God has already predetermined and chosen who would be saved and who would not be saved. In other words, God chose some for salvation and some for damnation, and he chose it of his own will without any kind of condition. But then there's the Arminians that say, we believe that God is sovereign over salvation, but we believe that God has given humanity the ability and responsibility to respond to the Lord Jesus Christ, that human beings make real decisions that have eternal consequence. This is the doctrine of election where people contend and argue about, well, are we to emphasize elect according to the foreknowledge of God, or are we to emphasize whosoever will may take of the water of life freely? Friends, I am not here to solve this tension for you. And now everybody's like, well, then what did we come here for? We want our offering back. Didn't we pay to have some answers? Hey, friends, here's what I want you to see. In the Word of God, there is the doctrine of election that says that God has elected and chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. 
And in the same scriptures, it says, and whosoever will may come and take of the water of life freely. I don't know how these two things exist in the heart of God without conflict. But I believe that because they are both in the same scriptures, we must not deny or neglect one or the other. Now, in this room, there are those that would call themselves Calvinists. And in this room, there are those that probably would call themselves Arminians. And we need not debate and argue and splinter unnecessarily. What we must not do is deny any teaching of the Scripture. So which is it? Did God choose us? Or does God make it so that whosoever will may come and drink and be saved? Well, some will want to emphasize election. And they'll say, well, what it means when it says whosoever, it means whosoever of the elect may come. But where does the Bible say whosoever of the elect may come? God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him. Well, but that's whoever of the elect. But the Bible never states that. Well, you go to the other side, it's like, no, whosoever will. Yes, but you can't deny the fact that the Bible teaches no man shall be saved unless the Father draws him. Friends, I don't know how these things fit together. Even the great scholar and theologian Wayne Grudem in his systematic theology book says this, somehow the free will of humanity and the sovereignty of God exist together such that one does not violate nor negate the other. The great brain Wayne Grudem is going to say that and I'm going to have a better answer? No. But here's what I do want you to see. I want you to see that God's word over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, says this. It's speaking of Jesus. It says that Jesus, there is a stone in Zion, a cornerstone. And then what does it say? Chosen, elect. Well, Jesus is the elect one. He's the chosen one. He is the precious cornerstone chosen by God for our salvation. Jesus, only Jesus, is the one who is to be worshipped and magnified. He's the one who will return, and at his very appearance, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here's a way that I kind of resolve this tension. You see, the Bible says that when I, by faith, trust in Jesus Christ, I am in Christ. Read all the scriptures that say that we are in Christ, that we are one with Christ Jesus. So I believe that what, Paul, what Peter is saying here and what Paul, I think, would also fit within saying is that when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we are one with him, one with the elect. We are now the elect of God. We came only because the Father drew us to salvation, but whoever receives the drawing of God and will by faith respond in obedience will be saved. I have a hard time, and I'm just going to tell you, you can hold whatever position you want to hold. Just defend it from the Scriptures. My struggle is that to say that God just arbitrarily of his own will and choosing from eternity past said these will be saved and those won't be doesn't seem to fit with the God of the Bible. But really, when you look here, notice this. Peter's not even talking about that kind of election. You're like, then why'd you spend the time? Because he's talking about the doctrine of election. But notice that in the Greek, the word which shows up in your English is actually before exiles. You may have the word pilgrim or sojourner. The word is modifying exiles. You are chosen exiles. Yes, you are exiles because you were chosen to be in Christ and receive his salvation 
But more than that, God has chosen you to walk a broken path. He's chosen you to be in him and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. And that has made you at odds in this world with those that are opposed to God. You have been chosen to be exiles in the dispersion. You have been chosen, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, to suffer. Is that not what Jesus taught? No servant is greater than the master. And if the master suffered because the world did not know him and hated him, will you not as his servant also suffer in this world? Will they not hate you? We have been chosen in Christ for salvation, but we have been chosen because of that salvation to suffer with him, to fill up the afflictions of Christ. If anybody ever told you, follow Jesus and the path will be perfect for you, they lied. In fact, in this world, you're going to have trouble whether you follow Jesus or not, but add following Jesus to the mix and it's going to be doubly hard. Because now you've just got the natural difficulty of living in a world that's broken. But you've also now taken on the hardship of living in a world that does not recognize your Father in heaven nor his authority. They think you're crazy, and they think that the world would be at a better place if they got rid of you. You see, the world thought that it would be a better place if they got rid of Jesus. The religious leaders are like, man, you're messing up our groove over here. Man, we were just jiving right along until you showed up. And if we could just kill you and get rid of you. Problem is, is they just fulfilled God's plan by putting Jesus to death. God raised him from the dead and now he is Lord reigning eternally. So when Peter says you are elect exiles, here's a great application. You are in Christ and nothing can ever separate you from Christ. You have been chosen so maybe you got picked last when you were being chosen. We were choosing teams for kickball or, or maybe the track team or maybe for the debate club. Maybe you were chosen last or maybe you weren't chosen at all, but God has chosen you. He has lavished his affection on you. Behold what great manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. And nothing can ever separate you from him. And whatever difficulty you're dealing with right now, the Father chose for you to face that. I know that doesn't make it go away. And it makes our mind hurt and it struggles to comprehend, God, why would you want me to suffer to face these trials and difficulties? Job didn't know either, but he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. If he has chosen for me to walk this road that feels unbearable, may he be glorified. May he bring others to salvation. May I be faithful to the end. He goes on to say this. We are not only the people chosen by God according to his purpose, but we are sojourners residing in a world that's not our home. Friends, you're not home yet if you're a follower of Jesus. Even if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're not home yet. Nobody lives here forever. The word sojourner means a person who's a temporary resident. You could say exile, you could say sojourner, you could say pilgrim. But it means a person who is living in a foreign place, but it's a temporary residence. This world is a temporary residence. Peter says to those who are elect exiles in the dispersion, you are living in a temporary place where you are scattered about. You don't get to spend time together and you've not yet entered to the place of being in the presence of your heavenly father. But this isn't your eternal home. The word exile there, which means temporary resident, is what they are. And that's what you and I are. We are living in a world that's not our home. Don't get too comfortable. 
The Bible says that it's appointed unto men once to die, and then comes the judgment. You don't know when that day's coming. Don't be too comfortable. You should be longing for the moment that you see him face to face, the moment that faith ends in sight. Don't be too comfortable. And these believers were not comfortable. Suffering was increasing. We don't know exactly when the letter was written, but it was probably written about the summer of A.D. 64. That would fit with the fact that Paul doesn't include Peter being in Rome at his writings. But if Peter doesn't speak about the great persecution that came about by the emperor Nero, then it must have happened before that occurred, which would have put it somewhere there, maybe by the summer of 64. You see, Rome burned. Most will say that Nero himself set the fire because he wanted to build new buildings, so he had to make way for them, so he set fire to the city himself. But when people were outraged by this, he pinned the blame on the Christians. And so it was that the Christians encountered a most hostile, vicious persecution. But Peter doesn't speak about that here. He can just see on the horizon the storm clouds growing. And he says, as you suffer in this world... As you live in a place that's not your home, that is often in opposition to you, you need to be reminded this is not your eternal home. You are just passing through. Too often we as followers of Jesus think this life's going to go on forever. We we think that we're going to live to be for sure 80, 90 years of age. We at least act like, even if we talk about death, as though, well, that's going to happen, but we still live as though every day we're living an eternal existence here. What would you stop doing today if life ended tomorrow? What would you start doing today if life ended tomorrow? We are only sojourners residing in a world that is not our home. And finally, Peter says that we are redeemed to be living in obedience to Jesus for his glory. He has chosen us, and he has chosen us to be exiles. And he has chosen us as exiles that we would live in obedience to Jesus for his glory. See how verse 2 says it. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father... In the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. That's what salvation is, and that's what it's for. The God foreknew that he would choose us for salvation, he has chosen us in Christ for salvation. And the Spirit of God has set us apart. Paul says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God convicts of sin, guides us into truth, and regenerates us. The Spirit of God calls us to salvation, and by faith, we are sprinkled with the blood of the Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. His blood is enough to atone for our sin. And here, he has saved us by setting us apart. When we trust in Jesus by faith, the blood covers our sin and we're set apart for Jesus Christ. Now we are to live for him. Notice that phrase, for obedience to Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't just save us so that we don't have to go to hell, but we can still live like hellions. And that's the way that some Christians seem to display salvation. Well, I'm not going to hell because I prayed a prayer and I was baptized. Yes, but Jesus saved you from something, sin and self and the consequences of it, that he might save you for something. That is obedience to Jesus for the glory of his name, 
for obedience to Jesus Christ. And doesn't that fit with the Great Commission? Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I commanded you. To be a disciple of Jesus is to be living in obedience to his commands. Jesus said it without stuttering and without ambiguity. He said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. You could flip that around. If you don't obey my commands, you really don't love me. So when God saved us, we have been redeemed to live in obedience to Jesus for his glory. We have received grace through faith. And now we have the peace of God and we have peace with God. May this grace and peace, Peter say, be multiplied to you. Friends, this is who we are. We have been chosen by God if we have indeed come to faith in Jesus Christ. We have been chosen to walk in the midst of trial and suffering and difficulty. And it is by the Father's foreknowledge and plan for His purpose and glory. And in the midst of being chosen by God to even deal with suffering and persecution, we have been redeemed for His glory, to be obedient to Him. Peter starts this way because everything he's going to say after this builds on this foundation. If this is who you are, this is how you should live. If this world is not your home, but you're going to your home in heaven, then sojourn on the earth like you're already living in heaven. And here's how you do it. How's God asking you to respond today? Perhaps you're going through a particular trial or suffering. And it's not what you would have chosen and it's not what you want. But God's just asking you to be reminded that he's in control. And as, even as we sing, he has a good plan even when it doesn't feel good. But we can thank him and trust him for his plan and what he's working. Maybe there's an area of disobedience that God's asking you to confess and repent of. Maybe there's an act of obedience he's asking you to take up. Or maybe today God's just made it clear to you that he is pursuing after you. And he wants you to come by faith and receive his life-giving salvation. Maybe there's another way the Spirit of God has taken His Word and properly applied it to your heart. If I didn't mention it, that doesn't mean you still shouldn't obey. Just say yes to God today. Would you bow with me as we come to a time of response? Musicians are coming, and I'm just going to ask of you, what's God's response for you today? What does he want from you? Are you willing to say yes, regardless of the cost or consequence? I'm going to step down and be at the front. I think there will be others who will be here as well to pray with you, to speak with you if you desire to talk with someone. But whether you respond right where you are or you come forward, let your response be obedience to Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for the grace that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the peace that we now know, a peace that passes all understanding because you've made peace through your blood by covering our sin. Oh, God, we pray that even now we would respond and obey you. God, whatever you desire to do right now, would you do it for your glory? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.